love this setup here. I feel like I'm on the set of a talk show or something. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm thinking. When I look around and see this, I think, hmm, I should invite some people up here. <laughs> I have most fun in these kind of conversations. Because uh, awakening is, uh, it can be gentle if we're really open and if we come and really, as the meditation was saying, just open our hearts and look inside whoever we're speaking to, where what we are speaking is what we most need to hear. So I think you probably have had that experience in groups a lot of times where things just pour through and you walk out and you go, wow, I need to remember that. That was good. <laughs> because you, you received it. You just showed up with the willingness to be truly helpful, like the prayer says. I'm here to be truly helpful, and then it comes back to you. It comes to you. You receive the message first to deliver it, and, but it's always for the mind. So, I'm just so grateful that we have such a beautiful setting here tonight, and thank you to Cheryl and Barrett and Dove for these amazing retreats that you put on out in amazing venues. Again, you've done it. We all feel blessed, we feel held in this place, and we feel very grateful. And then I also want to just acknowledge Helen Chuckman, Bill Thedford, Judy Scutch Whitson, Ken Wapnick, you know, for their amazing service to us. You know, it, to be among, we'll call it the first generation of working with a, a scripture like A Course in Miracles, it's, it's quite, uh, quite amazing. And I know a lot of you have studied different uh, non-dualistic teachings throughout the ages. And the Course is like the baby on the block. So, you know, we need to take it easy with the baby. <laughs> we need to be gentle with ourselves in, as we practice this. We need to be playful, you know, as we talked about earlier. And we need to have some fun with it because, uh, you know, we need to be light. <laughs> we need to travel light and journey lightly as Jesus says in the Course. And yet, we, we are not really bound by time. It's just the belief in linear time. It's just the investment that we have in the belief in the past and future. You know, the regrets of the past and the worries and concerns of the future. That's, that's what tries to distract us away from just being present, just experiencing the holy instant. And I think, uh, you know, we're going to go a long way with this course. It's going to just carry us in this lifetime through miracle after miracle and save us thousands and thousands of years of unlearning, we could call it, <laughs> that it would have taken us if we hadn't prayed and called on this, this help. So I feel such a gratitude for the way shower, Jesus, and for all those that have, have said yes to accept their part in the plan of atonement. I think one of the lines that was very important to me from the Course is, is that he says, this Course will believe, be believed entirely or not at all. And so I like that uncompromising quality of this course. This is not a course in compromise. This is a course in, in awakening. And I was having lunch with Judy Sketch and William Whitson recently and, and we got on the topic of what was going on when those, those books came. And basically, uh, Judy was the one to be the the publisher. She was the one that was given to be the publisher. And she went to Helen and she asked a very practical question at one point. She said, okay, uh, how many? Which is a, is a publisher's question. How many books shall we print? And, and she told me over lunch, she said that Helen said very 
directly and matter-of-factly four. <laughs> and Judy said, four? Does that mean 40,000? Uh, does it mean 4,000? You know, she was just fishing for something. And Helen said, no, I said four. And she said, four? Four? Who are the four four? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it was just, she was taken aback. And she said, for myself and Bill and you and Ken. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what's so great about the whole story is because Helen was quite reluctant and resistant, and then here she's saying four, and you know, I think she's thought, well, I've, I've done my job. <laughs> it's like, you, it's your part from here on. And also Judy said that she really didn't have any intention of the book ever being translated into other languages, either. So she was really focused on her part, and that's what I took from it, and yet, Judy did say in this last lunch that I've been having a bunch of lunches with her, she said, the last lunch, she said, you know, it's, we felt it was very esoteric, all of us. And, and as you understand, you know, Helen and Bill were research psychologists at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and they, they basically thought this, this book, I don't know how well it's suited for public consumption. They basically thought that it's, it reminded them of the old mystery schools that have existed over the centuries. Like that, they thought that's what the audience, we just need to find a mystery school for <laughs> this book and it will be well received. So they didn't really see the far reaching impact and they weren't really required to, you know. I think all of us have to remember that we're here to do our part. We have a very specific part that's assigned a part of the plan of atonement. It's called our special function. And we need to keep our full attention on that part, because if we start to wander off into other things, then it will distract us away from completing our part that our part is given. In fact, the Course says in the workbook, the script is written. And that seems to imply a destiny. It really reminds me of lesson number seven, I see only the past. We're watching seemingly a linear script and it's, it's over and done. This world was over and done long ago. I have friends too, and including myself, we just, as we move along with the Course, we have a lot of these deja vu experiences, like when you're meeting people or seeing situations <laughs> and you have that feeling like, I have seen this before. I have viewed this before. I think there was one point where Ken Wapnick said, all of history is a deja vu <laughs> experience. Yeah, wow, that's, that's amazing. We've got a plant in the audience. I need you up here, Barrett. <laughs> Just like George and Gracie, you got to have it. <laughs> you got to have it. So, I think because I read that line, uh, this course will be believed entirely or not at all, you know, that helped me kind of throw all my willingness, all my focus, all my energy, and I think, too, with the Course, because it's like the baby on the block, I think it actually helps to have read the lives of the mystics and saints to kind of have an idea about Advaita Vedanta, some of these other ones, and, and many of the way showers, you know, from ancient, ancient India and the gurus and everything. I think that actually gives, gives a, an important context to non-duality. I think if you try to work with the Course, and you don't have that context, you can lose sight of the mark uh, that this Course will be believed entirely or not at all. It's, it's quite easy, the ego is quite ingenious at making distractions to put off enlightenment and put off self-realization to another time, another lifetime or whatever, and that's really not what this Course is about. 
This is really about giving it everything you've got. And so for me, it was in the parable of David, I was very shy and quiet and they always say that Moses stuttered and he had to deliver the Ten Commandments. Gandhi was shy. You know, it's interesting when you look at some of these characters in the dream, they had to really let go of a lot to give themselves over to this. And we're really asked to let go of everything. The ego will tell you that's a sacrifice, but really we're not letting go of anything significant. It's more like we're just integrating. We're awakening to wholeness. We're not losing anything. There's no loss involved in this at all. So for me, I had to really question everything. Even things about the Course. I know people are fond of talking about the Course as a self-study book. But uh, when Jesus says in the Course, the ego enjoys studying itself, <laughs> that's like a beware. Beware even of self-study. We're here to collaborate, we're here to join, and it's all in mind, actually. But we really need to be open to our brothers and sisters. We can't think of this as just an intellectual endeavor, as we were hearing in our meditation. This is far beyond intellectual understanding and concepts. And I've had people say to me many years, I, I get that concept intellectually, but and I said, if you throw that word but in there, you've just negated <laughs> whatever you had at the beginning. <laughs> you can throw that out too. The Course cannot be understood intellectually. And therefore, it's a Course in relinquishing every concept and every idea that you've ever held. Buddha had it straight. Jesus had it straight. Empty the mind of everything you think you think and think you know. And the only way that we can do that is through trust. We have to trust the Spirit is guiding us and leading us. We can't trust our past learning. We can't trust jobs to support us. We can't trust opinions. We can't trust research. Now that we know in quantum physics that all of Newtonian and all of empirical research is, was all a projection. All of Newtonian physics, based on the belief that there's an external world and you can learn something about that through empirical knowledge. It was a lie. Quantum is now lining up with all the mystics and saints and poets and Rumi and you know, it's really beautiful, but we really have to let go of everything. Whenever you even hear the words, research supports, <laughs> you can right away. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're into intuition. We have to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I have a friend, Frances, and she basically is living a very mystical life. I'm really honored, actually. I, I live with a group of mystics that are really all over the world, but every one of them actually hear the voice for God. It's quite amazing community. We always hear about the Essenes and the Apostles and the Franciscans and everything. It's just an amazing thing when you live and work and collaborate with a group that really hear guidance. Actually, it's quite a harmony. It's quite a a living experience. It's quite a reflection, actually. I think, wow, what a reflection. This is the happy dream. We can commune. We have nodding heads. We don't have democracies or take votes or what's your opinion? You know, we don't, we've gone past that from living this course, from applying this course. It's an amazing daily mystery school of not knowing anything about this world and feeling gloriously happy. One of the members in our community, I was just speaking at Boulder last night, one of our members has had two levitation experiences. And she wasn't even really impressed by that. Levitating. You know, it was like a natural thing. The, the stillness is more important for, than the levitation. We've had symptom removals, raising the dead, the things that 
actually come about that we hear about from Jesus and people say, did those things really happen? But those are just reflections and witnesses and demonstrations and you are entitled to miracles. So when you're doing those lessons, it doesn't, didn't surprise me when those things started to happen. It didn't surprise me when revelatory experiences happened because he starts right off at the beginning of the book, at the beginning of the text, talking about miracles and revelation. Miracles are the means and revelation is the end. It shows you a glimpse of what this is all about. It's all there. And the book is there, I think, to assure us and reassure us to not be frightened of love, to not be frightened of the light. When we have those experiences, the ego may shudder and the ego may tremble, but you should not be afraid if you experience angels, daily angels. I think a lot of us are starting to feel we have daily angels showing up. I find myself saying that in my mind. Oh, angel, thank you. Angel, angel. Angel, angel. So we're here really to accept the atonement. That's our sole responsibility. Sole responsibility means it's the only responsibility. You may we were joking earlier about responsible for the heat. Uh, Cheryl and Barrett were <laughs> coming in there and apologizing for the heat. We may think we have financial responsibilities, we, we have relationship responsibilities, you know, we have responsibilities to family, friends, and the Holy Spirit is very practical. Jesus is very practical. So they will unwind your mind from these false concepts that the ego made and take your mind into a glorious state, a heavenly state. But there will be an unwinding. There will be an ex exchange of self-concepts for who you believe you are. You'll have an exchange, he tells us, in the self versus self-concept section of concepts. And you'll just go seemingly higher and higher up the ladder as you have more expansive identity concepts where you just have these aha moments and these oh so glorious moments where you do not feel you are the same as you were. You just gasp, oh I am so much more than I thought I was. Wow! Just keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. And Something that Jesus emphasizes, and I really like it, I, I'm really grateful that Dove and the One Mind Foundation is sponsoring this, because we aren't going to come to experience the fullness of light and love and joy and oneness until we can experience perfect equality in our experiences on earth. Dove is ringing that bell, he's been ringing that bell. I remember Dove from back in the AOL days, you know. We're ringing that bell. I think Cece Cobb was our, our contact of both of us. She was saying, Dove is... And you know, what that means is you get so much into this presence, so much into this love, that the idea of ahead or behind disappears. The idea of inferior, superior disappears. We have to let go of our concepts of teachers and students because Jesus tells us that we're teaching all the time by our thoughts. That's why he tells us, teach only love, for that is what you are. We're teaching every second. And teaching is not with words. If your words and your actions and your behaviors and your facial gestures all match up with this happiness and joy, with this state of mind, you've done really well. You can say, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. But we are perfectly equal. And therefore, it's our state of mind that really is teaching us. We're teaching and learning from our state of mind. We have to come to self-honesty just about what that state of mind is and really love it, be drawn to it. Wow, horses. <laughs> this is cool. I, 
We've got a great party going on here. It's like a, it's like a picnic. They're waving. <laughs> They're all waving at us. <laughs> Talk about reflections of equality. Horses go by and waving people. <laughs> hey, you people in there. <laughs> so, so let's not put anybody up on a pedestal. Neither should we condemn anyone, uh, because because behaviors aren't the whole picture, and because everything that we see is an outward picture of an inward condition. If we see something we don't like in the world or in a behavior, it's simply something we need to pluck out of our own consciousness. If we see an enemy, then we need to pluck that out. We're not going to find that perfect equality unless we are good at plucking, plucking, plucking judgmental thoughts plucking opinions. And, wow, I, I feel like the only reason I ever talk about the parable of David is because they're just symbols of, of trust, of divine trust. Hitting the open road for five years with, with no financial support, no organizational support, just going out like the sannyasis from India, you know, just going out there and seeing what shows up, talking to Jesus, listening to Jesus. This is fun. It's, it builds your trust. It, it takes you beyond economics. It takes you beyond fears of survival. It takes you outside of careers, outside of jobs. It, you know, I, I really took an early retirement uh, when the course came. Uh, I, I still had student loans to pay, but Jesus, you know, here, you're going to go here, you're going to work at this, we got to clear this up first, and then you're mine. I'll use you in ways you can't even comprehend, so don't even ask, or don't, don't even try to figure out the future. I've got you. I will go before you and make straight your path, and leave no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar your way. To, to go beyond the words of that beautiful passage, the promise, to go into the actual experience of divine love and, and trust leaves you in a state where you don't have a care or a worry about anything at all. That's what this is about. He says, can you imagine how wonderful it was to have such a quiet, tranquil mind? That is what time is for, to learn just that and nothing more. He's, he's inviting us into stillness. And we have to trust to do that. We're not going to be able to carry on this past learning, this old conversation of what have I got to do and how am I going to do it. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are the how. Now, there's a lot of books that are written about A Course in Miracles, and I love them. I feel like we've been blessed by them because they can clarify things, point things out, give you examples So great to have Gary and Cindy here. Disappearance of the universe. I mean, did that boost anyone's appreciation of A Course in Miracles? <laughs> yeah. You better believe it did. You better believe it. Arden and Persa, thank God. <laughs> because, because you need examples, you need pointers. And you also need some crystal clear metaphysics. You know, I think one thing that Gary and I have talked about around the world is you, you've got to have clear teachings on the Course. The ego is going to try to distort this and turn it and twist it in all kinds of different ways. And I'm pretty fond of saying that the really spiritual awakening, authentic spiritual awakening, is 1% is principle and 99% practice. But you've got to be clear in that principle. If you don't have a clear principle and you're practicing an erroneous principle, even with 99% practice and diligence, you're still not going to hit the mark. You're still not going to have the experience. Also, there's a lot of books, you know, that are supplemental to the Course, complementary to the Course. I think some of you have read Carol Howe's book on Bill Thetford's life. What a blessing. Everyone heard about 
Helen, which was helpful through absence from Felicity, but I was a good friend with Car- Carol Howe on my travels to Florida. And yeah, she lived here in Colorado. Had Bill coming over here to Colorado, to Denver, to visit her quite often. And so I had a lot of long conversations with Carol, and that was helpful too. You know, we need way showers. We need those who practice the course and live the principles. And even though Bill showed up at a lot of course groups in California, he didn't have a lot to say. But oh, could you feel his presence. Everyone I've ever met in California who was at those gatherings talks about the presence. And, you know, some people don't know this about Bill, but he he left Helen when he moved across to the West Coast. He was with Jerry Jampolsky and Judy and a group of them up there, but he left them too. He went down to be with the Luckets down in Southern California. Has anybody here had the pleasure and the joy of meeting the Luckets, the initial teachings? My God! My God! My first trip out around the country in 1991, I stopped in Sedona and there were these two people sitting up front with a big crowd doing a garden party and wearing baseball caps. He was retired military. And then I listened in, I was like, wow, thank you Holy Spirit, this is great to hear these people. They're really experiential, I really like that. And then they all took off uh, and I, I thought, I'll just follow along. I just happened, happened upon the whole gathering. I didn't even know it was there. And I followed them down towards the creek beds of Sedona. They were baptizing people. This is a course in miracle students. They took the course all over the world. All over the world. I would go places, Australia. They say, oh, the Luckets were here 10, I mean, 15 years ago, 20 years ago at the same beach. And I'm like, oh. So... <laughs> I'm walking down, I'm just following, I don't, at the time I didn't know they were going to take people to the creek beds to baptize them. You know, that's stretched pretty far out. But I was following along the crowd, all of a sudden this woman, she was, I think she was all dressed in purple and she had the baseball cap and she came swirling around me and she planted the biggest kiss on my cheek and it was Eulalia. What an expression of joy. Actually, the Luckets were Bill Thedford's teachers. He literally had gone through studying it and practicing it. And when he left Northern California, he said, I have to find joy. I have to find fun. He, had, he was really diligent with it, but he needed to find the fun factor. And the Luckets were that fun factor. And I, I've spent some time with them in Hawaii. They're still alive up in the 80s. And... Um, I had lunch with him one time, and a friend of mine, Jason, was like saying, uh, how do you practice the Course nowadays? What are you doing? They said, we still sleep on, we switch opposite sides of the beds every night because we don't want to get too associated to one side of the bed. (laughs) Practicing a Course in your 80s, living it, loving it. We don't want to get too accustomed to being having our own side of the bed. No ownership. No possession. Let go of familiarity. Let go of everything you think you know, everything you think you think. I love it. I have such appreciation. Those are, again, I was taking a group of people around and I called it the Legends Tour. You know, we stop in and visit Jerry Jampolsky, the Luckets, you know, Carol Howe, Judy Witt, all of them, Bob. You know, it's a great tradition, and it's a great reflection because there's a lot of devotion in that first generation, and every spiritual tradition has the elders. In the Native American tradition, the elders are important, the elders of the tribe. All traditions have the elders. There's an honoring of that reflection. And that's what I feel in my experiences with them is just being with them, I feel an honoring and a thank you. And that same thank you just rings out across the whole world. It just grows in your heart and it spreads to everyone that you meet. And 
I feel it's important to talk about those things. Another thing, too, is there, there can be a lot of books written about the Course, and you know, I know right now they're talking about the Trilogy and Way of Mastery and Course of Love, and, and there's, there's been a lot. I mean, I've been around with the Course for three decades, so I don't know, if, does anybody see the Course of Marigolds? They, <laughs> some of us have been around, we saw the Course of Marigolds. It's kind of a, a humor, we're bringing in a lot of humor. But my intuitive feeling is that this is a very, very, very deep course, and we really need to practice the actual principles of A Course in Miracles. That I got to a point when I had this extreme clarity in my mind that then Jesus said, here, look, look at here, look at this, and I would even be out on a teaching tour and I would go through a like a TV store, and they would have news of some war that broke out, and then he would scoop it up and use that and mention it in the talk. But I was pretty oblivious. I actually been traveling so much that I was unaware when wars would break out. I had so many Course in Miracles gatherings. People would have to say, David, did you hear about the war? Oh. <laughs> actually, yes. I walked by a TV <laughs> store today, and I heard just enough, and the Spirit would use it. But but we, I, I would say one of the things I really want to focus on is that, that the practical application requires practicing the Course, and the whole workbook of A Course in Miracles is actually based on transfer of training, making no exceptions to the principles. It's an amazing teaching, and I would say for most students and teachers of the Course, there's more transfer of training errors that seem to come up than uh, teaching the errors that are part of the metaphysics. You know, that's why I say it's 99% practice. We're here to get the gist of it. And we have 31 chapters to really help us get the gist of it, but then we got to get into the laboratory, <laughs> you know, like in science class, and get in there and get those test tubes out and start mixing those elements and that's our life, you know, our worldly not life. We're here practicing. Mist, it's, it's grist for the mill, as they used to say, you know, everything's grist for the mill. So, another thing I like about the way the format of this is set up is that I, here we're going to have spiritual roundtables. Uh, I saw Craig's name on there and Dove. I like that. I think um, it reminds me of, of Socrates and the, the amazing Socratic dialogues where people would come together, they could raise any question, bring up any issue, talk about metaphysics or concepts or anything, talk about practical application. I think it goes faster when you come with a willing, open heart for discussion. When you say to yourself, well, I'm, I'm trying to practice the Course, but I've got some questions and I've got some issues. Is it all right if I raise them? Yes, it is. It's a big yes. Raise anything, any fear, any doubt. That's why in this Course in Miracles monastery I have in Utah, you know, we have two guidelines, no people pleasing, no private thoughts. We're not so much into rituals or vows, but we want to encourage open expression. Don't hide it. Don't repress it. Don't deny it. You're not going to heal it if you are pushing it out of awareness. Let's welcome it in. Ali Ali Income Free. Come on. Darkness? Yeah. Attack thoughts? Come on. Come on up. Dark night of the soul? Come on. Bring it on. I'm into ascension. I'm into spiritual awakening. I'm not going to dance. I'm not going to do tap show, tap dance around these issues. And to me, that's, that's why our community is quite telepathic, why we have such harmony and nodding of heads, why we can feel things before they even seem to happen, is because we've been very good at exposing the darkness. And there have been great teachers. I, I think of Ken's focus for all those years about exposing the darkness. That's really the first half of forgiveness is exposing the darkness. But if you really study the Course, Jesus tells you 
that exposing the darkness isn't the whole picture. As important as it is, and practically speaking for most human beings, they spend most of their lives doing that, really what forgiveness is, is looking with the Holy Spirit past the defiled altar to the light of the atonement. That's what forgiveness is. There's one point where he says, do not see error. And he puts it in italics. Ooh. Do not see error. How am I going to do that except with the Holy Spirit? That's what forgiveness is. That's why you forgive your brother and sister for what they did not do. Because it's the Holy Spirit that looks past the defiled altar to the light of the atonement. And the only way you actually can live a happy, joyful, peaceful life is to be so aligned with the Holy Spirit that that's all you're doing. You don't even see the error. You're not going to get into an argument around error because you don't see it when you allow your mind to be lit up by the Holy Spirit. Now some teachers and different ones talk about guidance and you can hear the Holy Spirit, you can't. Absolutely. I and everyone I work with has had the only sole goal of hearing the voice for God. In fact, Jesus says that that's the only purpose of the body, to let the voice for God speak through it. And you know, coming from a shy guy, Gary and I both were shy guys. There's no doubt about it. Very shy. I think both of us would fit into that category. And yet, we tend, now the Holy Spirit's got us being spokesmen for God around the world. Doesn't matter how shy we were. Holy Spirit said, no, this is too important. You have one function for your body. Now, step aside and let me come through. <laughs> and uh, what do you think disappearance and the, the following books were about? What do you think the teachings are all about? The ego uses the body for pride, for pleasure, for attack, and basically you have to let go of those ego uses and let this communication device be used as a communication device for God. That's how we wake up. It really works. I'm happy. <laughs> you know, I, I just trust it. I, I think it's Jesus. He knows what he's talking about. He's gone through the keyhole of time and space and come out the other end, so I will follow the instructions. And he, he's given a really good set of instructions. We just need to practice it. We, we need to let go of these self-concepts of who we think we are and what our limits are and what our fears are and say, I'm going to trust and I'm going to let you come to me and come through me. So, like Helen, she heard, it wasn't an audible voice, but she heard a, it was like a, a train of thought that she was clearly aware that wasn't Helen Shuckman. And so she followed. This is A Course in Miracles. Please take notes. Thank God she, she followed and took notes. <laughs> Shorthand notes and Bill and you know Ken and all. We, we have a great course. But I would say, too, that my life has been completely devoted to listening and following that voice. And amazing miracles have happened. Daily miracles. Many, many miracles. That's what you need. You need to be miracle-minded. You need to be habitually miracle-minded to be consistently happy. That's the formula, so to speak. Consistently miracle-minded takes you closer towards that revelatory awakening experience. Guided in terms of where to go. What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say and to whom? You know, really to get into that mode and make that your life. And that's the beauty. I think we've got some amazing speakers this weekend that can testify that it works, that can just testify and witness. Because nobody can do this for anybody else, and we've, we've come to experience there really isn't anybody else. <laughs> There's just one mind that's got to get this. And if we're willing to totally go for this, then the reflections get stronger and stronger and stronger. Another line in the Course 
it was really kind of striking. It said, if you are devoted, you are entitled to devotion. I find that fascinating. You're entitled to miracles. That's one of the workbook lessons. But you are, if you are devoted, you are entitled to devotion. In fact, this world is nothing more than the call to witnesses. So when I'm finding in my awareness, in my dreamscape, these devoted, amazingly devoted brothers and sisters that have cast aside all to give their lives over to the Holy Spirit to be used for the plan of awakening, I find that spectacular. I've quit counting how many of these witnesses are coming of devotion. That's part of the pathway. If you are devoted, you are entitled to devotion. That sounds kind of Eastern. You know, anyone knows the story of Yogananda, Ramana Maharshi? There's some devotion going there. I've been over to India and gone to some of these places and ashrams. I love the feel. I love the feel before I walk in the door. I'm going, woo. <laughs> so I'm into some convents and monasteries. Woo. I feel, I get the chills before I even get to the door when I'm in the parking lot. Oh, gosh, is that good. That's, there's some devotion going on there. And, and you can feel it. It's tangible. So that's what it happened to me after studying the Course for, for five years. Uh, Holy Spirit and Jesus took me on a road trip in 1991. that basically has gone on. <laughs> it never stopped. But, uh, but that road trip, you know, involved uh, going through the Southwest, stopping in and visit, visiting Robert Perry and his, current, his wife then, Susan, of going out visiting Beverly Hutchinson, got to meet her mother, going up to was then the California Miracle Center, now it's Community Miracle Center, and visiting the, some amazing ministers there, going up and meeting a, a woman on Whidbey Island who had left the Foundation for a Course in Miracles, worked with Ken and Gloria for many years, just lit up, rosy cheeks, t telepathic, high, flying high in love, you know, going across the country and going to God's Country Place. Yes, before it was Endeavor Academy, it was God's Country Place. And it was kind of a surreal, everything slowed down in slow motion. Gary and I have had a couple of interesting visits there. For me, it was like the Stepford Wives. It started coming out of the woods. <laughs> but this is like a Stepford Wives movie. <laughs> but it was all telepathic, it was all silent. They didn't bump me, but they, it was, it was surreal <laughs> going there. But, you know, the openness to go around and around and around and around, that was just the first trip out. Because we're always teaching what we would learn, we're always extending what's in our hearts so we can strengthen it in our awareness, and that's the function of a miracle worker, to, to follow the Spirit and go and extend love and forgiveness and strengthen it in our mind. So that was 25 years ago for me. That was a, what I just described. That was a quarter of a century ago. And it, it was a good start, but there was a lot more to come. <laughs> there was a lot of darkness. There was a lot of shadow work. There was a lot of deep, dark, unconscious stuff that still had to come up. And that was just, I was only beginning there. And I think that's important, too, to be able to talk openly about that because we're here to support one another. We really are here to walk hand in hand to the light. And I mean hand in hand. So that when one of us seems to stumble and one of us trips, we don't fall because we've got a good grip of our brothers and sisters right beside us on this journey. We will not be turned away from the light we will not succumb to fear. We will not succumb to doubt. We will apply this course and we will learn it entirely. I don't know about you, but not at all is not really an option. <laughs> I, when I heard that from Jesus, you will believe this course entirely or not at all, I said, not at all is not an option. I'm not going to devote my life to not at all. You know, <laughs> And I'm so glad, I'm so glad I gave myself over to the Course. 
And now I'd have to say that the Course is just one among a, a lot of amazing pathways, but, but as I've traveled around the world, when I first went to Communist China in Beijing, my teachings had been translated into Mandarin, so people came from all over China. Uh, there was over a hundred, and what I learned when I was there was, it was almost like a momentum happened. People heard by word of mouth to come, and most of the people of the hundred were not Course in Miracles students. They just were all excited. Oh, did you read this stuff? It's, ah, come and see, let's go see this guy, my gosh. And they came, and it was quite amazing. Then when I went back, they had, I, they had like people with flowers at the airport. Uh, you know, some of you about know about Ama, who travels, amazing, hugging saint from India. You know, and I would walk out, and I'd come out through security, and I'd look, and I'd see people with flowers, and I was like, flowers. The first time that I had people start coming toward me and running toward me was when I was down in, in Cali, Colombia at the airport. And I, I stepped out of the airport and I saw a whole cheering crowd. Again, they'd translated my materials into Spanish, so they, they'd been really working with the depth of the materials in Spanish. And they were all cheering. It was a big crowd cheering. I just started looking around. I thought, Paul McCartney or somebody... <laughs> must be on the plane. I was just, I was all excited too, you know. <laughs> Who is it? It's got to be a celebrity. <laughs> they were cheering for me, but it was more that they had just been diving into the course and the materials in Espanol. And uh, it still startles me a little when I, I go to these places. I, but what it is, is to me, it's just symbols of devotion. You know, when you have a devoted heart, of course you call forth symbols. It's not special or different or unique or anything like that. It's just, it's actually natural for miracle working. When you are a miracle worker, you call forth the miracles, the witnesses. You'll never be able to see, perceive the Holy Spirit, but you can sure tell that the Holy Spirit is active by the reflections that you see by the smiles, by the joy, by the laughter. That is how you know the Holy Spirit is working in you and through you. You will never perceive the Holy Spirit, but you will perceive the witnesses. None of us have ever seen the wind. <laughs> but, oh, on a hot night like this, do we appreciate a breeze. Cheryl, do I get an amen to that? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, all these comedians. So, yeah, I just, as I close for tonight, I'm not closing. No, it's got, my gosh, there's all kinds of time. I would like to open it up. Do we actually have a, um, any kind of a roving mic or, or better yet, a little seat here that people could come up and a, like a gun? We have a hot seat. Okay, we'll move the mic over, and um, this is the best part. And if, if there's a group of you who want to come up, then you can... <laughs> I've got a couch up here and a chair, but we've got a microphone. Craig's got it set up. To me, the best part of, of anything is just opening up for Q&A, and I know I think we're going to have uh, panels and all kinds of cool stuff like this, but I think th when you come and you share from your heart, whatever it is, you are a witness to the healing power of being open and being transparent. And all of us can benefit from that. I love it when I'm watching something and I see somebody stand up and go and sit there with Muji or Gangaji or whoever and be there in presence. So, is anybody... Here we go. I like it. Our first willing volunteer. <laughs> so hello, my name is Victoria. I'm from New Mexico. Can we get some more uh, water? You recently said, I, I know it's not real. I know I need to forgive this, but I just have your curiosity. 
You said, Jesus said something about exposing the darkness so that you can fix it or you can bring it up to heal it. So <laughs> as a collective consciousness, is that why we have our current presidential campaign? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's that's a good question. You know, I see all these comments and commentary on uh, on Facebook, but the, my the one that I've enjoyed the most was when they asked uh, Deepak Chopra about the candidate Donald Trump, uh, and Deepak, he was saying. Well, <laughs> he he said, Donald is doing us all a great favor, a great service, because he is reflecting our unconscious thoughts and beliefs as they are coming up, and so when we need to see them, so he is doing us all a very very great service by reflecting these back to us. And the questioner said, "Okay, but does that? I I don't have to vote for him uh, in the fall." And Deepak said, that is part of the collective decision, and we shall see what that is. <laughs> oh my, Deepak was so clear, clear as a bell, so detached, because he was simply pointing out the mirroring that's going on, which is all the Course is telling us, and the script is written, and basically everything that seems to play out in form is a motion picture of our belief system. And we're here to heal that belief system. We're here to forgive it. And it, it is, and so, it's so that's so practical. I loved Deepak's answer because he didn't uh, try to to lean for or against. And I think it was Descartes who said years ago, "It's nothing is good or bad, but thinking that makes it so." We've got an erroneous belief system and an erroneous system of thoughts, of judgments, positive judgments and negative judgments that are all part of this dualistic system that's covering over our light of truth. So it's actually, if we take that mirroring principle and we take it out to what seems to be the political arena, it seems to involve a big scale. And that can seem to bring up a lot of emotions too, like, oh no, in terms of the size. But remember the first principle is there's no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not bigger, larger, harder than another. So that's my take on things and that's the life of, of joy and mysticism is again being in that that flow of all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. That thing, uh, let all things be exactly as they are. That's another beautiful lesson from the Course. And that's the direction that we're, we're being called to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, that was good. Well, we just handled the politics for the night, for the for weekend. <laughs> You've got some good ones too. Okay, that's good. Uh, hi there. Hi. Should I be speaking into this? You can, or you can pull it out if you want to turn your head and it. It, maybe we could even bring it over to this side. That's that might be good. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, can, if everyone can hear you, that's good. Um, two two years ago, my uh, little brother uh, he shot and killed a uh, seventy eight year old man that had sexually abused him as a child, and um, he then uh, shot and killed a uh, deputy sheriff, and uh, then he shot and killed himself, and. Um, so I was having some troubles with two things. Um, one is, uh, I feel horrible, like, why, why would I project something that's that horrible to happen to my family? And then the other thing is, if it's an illusion, did Ricardo ever exist? Because I don't want to live in a world where I don't know if he's real. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we start to gain from the Course that helps us is we start to see that that the belief in attack is in the mind and when that belief in attack is projected to the world we have things like what was witnessed in 
Orlando and what you're sharing now and, and so forth. Uh, from most perspectives, including the Bible, you know, uh, if we look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, uh, that's still giving us guidelines that are basically behavioral. Um, I think if you went even through the Ten Commandments, you could say that most of them are behavioral, and then that thing about thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, covet. You're starting to get into the mind. And what's so good about the Course, because Jesus said things like, you know, uh, verily, verily, I tell you, if, if a man has a lustful thought for a woman, not his wife, he commits adultery. You see, lustful thought. He's, he really was teaching that is, we must work with our thoughts. It is our thoughts alone that we must work with. I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. So we would say, if we just follow those beautiful teachings of Jesus in the Course and, and in the Bible, he's basically saying that, that what we would call murder and killing, which there's a trembling and a, and a fear, is a thought. And he's basically leading us through his mind training system to see that this whole world is a world of ideas. There's really not a, an actual external world because projection is an ego dynamic. It just tries to make it seem like it's being acted out. It's, it's taking form. So, if you can work with the Course and focus on paying attention to your emotions and your thoughts and just take Jesus at his word, like, I'm never upset for the reason I think. And, and those kind of things. My thoughts are images I have made. My meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. If you really go into this mind training system, there will be all kinds of hurt, of, of deep sadness, of fear, of guilt. There will be all kinds of intense emotions that will come and pass through, um, almost like if you were going on a plane and taking off and you were going through the clouds. You have to allow all that to come. And yet, it's a retranslation. It's not trying to push those feelings down, not trying to deny them, uh, letting them come and everything. And for me, I would say the, the years before the Course came into my life, I, I think I cried uh, in, a, in the basement of my parents' home, I think for about 10 years of tears that started coming, and they, it was like Niagara Falls. They just, it, the tears came and came and came. It was like some kind of a huge emotional flush that I had to go through is preparing myself for the Course. And most people find that they, they have periods when they're going through the Course that that's what happens. One time I had a friend too who, who I said, I think it'd be helpful to watch The Matrix, and she said, I'll try, but that's just an extremely violent movie. I don't know if I can make it through. She made it through like 10 minutes, and then I said, okay, well, go back, take notes, and just journal your emotions and see. And she was able to journal her way through the movie and pause it, you know, with a, a DVD. But she worked so much over a period of weeks at letting all those judgments about this violent movie come up that by the end, she called me up and she took me to a Cinemax, one of those big screens. We sat like in the third row <laughs> where Neo's nose was, <laughs> you know, from that angle. And, and we sat through the whole thing and she just was so happy. In fact, she enjoyed all the reflections of the people around us, their comments of how helpful the movie was to them, how healing it was. So she, in a span of a few weeks, went from seeing that it's not, there aren't really violent movies, the, the judgment in our mind, the attack thoughts and judgment, that's the violence. And, uh, you know, I think Ken was using the example one time of microorganisms that you can't even see in the human body. He was saying something about every time you take a breath, every time you take a step, you, you kill. <laughs> thousands and thousands, maybe millions. And he said, so when you get sick, it's just the revenge of the microorganisms, he was saying, you know. He, he had some crazy fun stuff. But, you know, that would be a, an interesting movie, Revenge of the Microorganisms, you know, as they come, come, I'll get you back for breathing, another breath, 
you took my family out with that breath, you know. Uh, but see, what we, we have to start to see what's going on in the mind. And if you really see Jesus' teaching, and I call it divine rationality, there's one point where he says, I am not a body, and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. That's one of his divine logic things. And it's actually very powerful if you follow it. I am not a body, so we have to disidentify from thinking we're this projection. And my mind cannot attack. In other words, the belief in separation from God is, is a mind attack. It's not people shooting or people hacking each other or fighting, karate. You know, it's, it's the belief that I could pull my mind away from God. That's the attack. But my mind cannot attack. So I cannot be sick. So the next time you start to feel some symptoms coming on, try that one out. Just come right back in your mind with some divine logic. I am not a body and my mind cannot attack. Because this whole world is a projection of the belief in attack. As a smokescreen, as a distraction, as a, it's like a substitution so that you get caught up into these actions killing and, and shooting and all those things, and that you get so swept away in the projection that you don't go within. You don't look within to find that. I'm too, like I don't meditate because I'm too scared to look inside. I don't know what's in there. It's too scary. Yeah. yeah. But I know that that's where all the answers are too, but I just I haven't been ready yet. That's it. You said it. You haven't been ready. So there's one part of the Course where Jesus says, when you find resistance high and dedication weak, you are not ready. Do not fight yourself. So again, it's all there. I had those moments too where I would pop the book open and pray and that's the kind of stuff I would get. What kind of a tool tells you to put it down? I mean, you know, that's a damn good tool. If, if the tool tells you to put, put it down. You know. I haven't found that yet in the Gita or some of these other ones. So, you're very welcome. I mean, I think that's part of that. Be gentle. Be gentle with yourself. Just be kind. Process, yes. So yes. Yes. And that love is drawing you to, to do this healing for the whole universe. And you're very courageous to do that. And you have all of the love and support of all of us with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do a follow up on politics. We've got, <laughs> he says it's not a, let's continue on. Well, this is the State of the Union. Yes, very good. I, from, uh, from time to time, I, it's probably about once a year, um, what I call the State of the Union. Can everyone hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Back there too? Kind of sort of. Okay. Can pull it in. Yeah, you can even pull it off of there if you want to just talk into it. That's probably the easiest. Yeah, so um, it happens about once a year a State of the Union address comes to me, and it's like, okay, <laughs> not uh, politics as usual. It's, um, it's, it's the truth. So... I don't want to delve too much into the story, but um, I got pulled over uh, on the way here. I kind of bless every state. I drove here from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And That's uh, great. I bless every state. You know, liberty and justice for all was the blessing this time. A little bit, woo, like shortly afterwards. Illinois, my home state, interestingly enough. Some would call it in the story the most corrupt state of the entire union. I probably wouldn't uh, argue that. Um, but, anyways. 
I was completely calm. There was no reaction to me. And the police officer said, how are you doing? I'm like, good, how about you, you know? And uh, he's like, where are you going? I'm going, I said, I'm going to retreat. And he's like, what is it about? And he genuinely wanted to know. And I'm like, well, it's Course in Miracles base. Are you familiar? He's like, no. I'm like, okay, how do I give it to him? And I'm like, uh, so I'm like basically, it's everything is a miracle. I'm, how do I, you know? Yeah. And I'm seeing that conversation, like this is happening, it's the miracle. So he gives me the ticket. He's like, we do enforce it, you know. I said, okay, and I may not pay it. Um, <laughs> Did you say that to no, him? No. <laughs> you just thought it. Now no, he's, he's watching his thoughts. <laughs> right, right. You know, I don't like seatbelts on the, on the open road, and <laughs> wind blowing, you know, so God's law. Yeah. So State of the Union came to me shortly after that, and um, I don't have it memorized, so I it just... I felt like this was going to be shared anyway, so um, here it is. In thy grace, in my perfect state, the United States, the state of the Union, I state, on the freedom road, cruising through fields of gold, driving further and further into the earth, the heart of America the home of the brave, the heartland where dreams are made, just past wounded flags, half-mast, trail of tears, this too shall pass, God's law, liberty and justice, love above all, union indivisible, we the people, hear your call, with the angels of the republic, we cannot fall, U.S., us, in God we trust. Oh, say, can you see? This land was made for you and me, my fellow Americans. We are free. We are free. And the weekend of freedom. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I love the title of this weekend, weekend of freedom. And it was interesting too because the line from the Course was coming, what do you want, freedom of the body or freedom of the mind, for both you cannot have. That's an interesting line from Jesus. So for me, that these last 30 years have been really an investigation of show me freedom of the mind. And release me from my concepts of freedom of the body, because those concepts we have, we talk about people imprisonment at times, or where we feel like we're confined, or in the body, and, and we have great witnesses like uh, Mandela and Gandhi, who really went for freedom of the mind, freedom that's in the core of our being, and I think that's a very ambitious topic, actually, for us all this weekend. And a beautiful prose. It's like a, it's a reminder, it's like a keynote mm -hmm. reminder. We're ringing a bell to really go for that experience. And the temptations, I remember, yeah, I had a, I think I got a Yamaha motorcycle. I remember getting pulled over years ago and practicing my Course in Miracles lesson <laughs> as the cop was coming around or something. It was a pretty old model. I think there was some fumes coming <laughs> out the back or something. But, you know, we practice with everything that comes and that's the glory of it. And it is quite a thorough practice to release all of our concepts of freedom that we've projected onto the body. One of the sections in the course that helped me out was the hero of the dream section, where he contrasts other sections, the dreamer of the dream, basically saying that's where your freedom comes, is when you see that you're the dreamer of the dream. But the hero of the dream, uh, the serial adventures of the body, <laughs> he makes it sound so fun, you know, it almost makes it sound like a soap opera or something. The serial adventures of the body is, are the hero. And there's such a focus on was it was it good? Did it hurt you? Did you did it help you? All the things around the environment, all the things uh, that 
that seem to involve conditions of the body, we have to realize that if we free our mind, then the body will be useful as long as it's needed and gently laid aside. That sounds really appealing to me. Uh, some of you know Yogananda, the story, story of Paramahansa Yogananda, that he was out there, in, I believe in L.A. At a, at a museum, had given a talk and then was having dinner with his disciples and then said goodbye. <laughs> and then his body just remained in a state of non-decay for weeks. That's a pretty strong symbol of a highly, highly trained mind. And I see those as inspirations for us that we know that this is a course in mind training. We can take heart that we can give our life over to that mind training. And when we're tempted to think that it's something external, something in the world that's causing something of our body, we can just see that that's just another victim thought. As if something not our will, something outside of us is doing something to us. And so I've had a lot of practice with that. You know, I'm visiting people and and I say, do you have a cup of coffee or something? Well, it's 11.30 at night. You know, you don't want to be drinking too much caffeine. <laughs> you won't sleep. You know, that's a cause and effect relationship. And the whole course is teaching us that, that God is the cause, Christ is the effect. God is the creator, the creation is Christ. And that the whole world is the projection of this idea that cause and consequence, cause and effect, are actually real in linear time. All of our disciplines, everything we've ever learned since childhood and all the way up through university is based on what Jesus calls spurious cause-effect relationships. That there's causes in the world and there's effects. And many of them regard the body. You know, don't stay out to the sun too long or your radiation will give you cancer. You see that? The sun is being blamed for the cancer when we know that it's just there's some attack thoughts eating away in there <laughs> that we're not willing to forgive and that's a reflection of that. So for me, I enjoy quantum physics, I enjoy everything that I'm reading. I enjoy, I mentioned last night in Boulder, Abraham Maslow. Did anyone remember Abraham Maslow, his hierarchy of needs? What was at the top? Self-actualization. That's know thyself. That's what the Greeks were telling us. That's what Jesus is telling us. And yet, what was one of the characteristics of self-actualizing people? That means and end were the same. They were so in the moment, so in the, the yoga, so in the art, so in the, the, even athletes, in the zone. They were so in the moment that they were in the joy of that moment and they weren't thinking, where is this leading? Like the artist who's painting, or we'll say being painted through, not thinking, when will I finish the painting? How much money will this bring? You know, all those future consequences. Abraham Maslow was right on it when he said that self-actualizing people saw that there was no difference between means and ends. And, and that's where all kinds of problems come in with reciprocity. Where is this going to bring me? Where is this going to take me? All those fears and doubts. Where, where is this heading? You know, will I be alone? Will I be like a bag lady? Or will I be homeless if I follow this course? You know, because we, we have people like St. Francis. You know, they seem to... <laughs> There's one... <laughs> Why don't you come up here, Cheryl? The leader of the manor. We need to just come up here for a minute. Tell us about the trust. You have I think this is air you're breathing. <laughs> That's right. From the matrix. Somebody told me you were homeless. So I, I want to hear your, your walk of trust. Because I guess it was a walk of trust just to come out here. And yeah, I want you to share that. Because this is what we're talking about. This is trusting in the miracle. Just to 
be honest. I had to be honest with myself. I thought I knew what I wanted. You know, I wanted that house and that marriage and those children. I wanted it all. And yet, I was miserable. And I'm in so much pain. And then I lost everything in the outside world. And I got to the place where I just asked, is this really all there is? Because if this is all there is, I don't want this. I don't. And within, I would say within a week of me really feeling that, I remember what I was doing. I was walking down the street, I was going to the library, and I was just like, I was like, God, if this really is all there is, I don't want it anymore. I had a phone call that day, within an hour, had somebody called me, and I hadn't talked with her in over 20 years. She's a course student. And she said, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I was just talking to God. <laughs> and I told them, I'm done with this. I'm done. I don't want to live like this anymore. She's like, well, you stay right where you are. I'm coming to get you. Because there's a really cool workshop this weekend at Unity. I'm like, really? Oh, okay, yeah, I've been trying to get there. Great. And it changed my life from that moment on. I started studying the course, and I started asking a lot of questions, and then I started meeting beautiful people. And people just came into my path because I was asking those questions. And I was really honest with myself. And I'll tell you, it was scary. I was really scared. You know, I, I, I got to a place where it's like, what, you know, really? I mean, I can't hold a job. Uh, my kids think I'm nuts. Um, <laughs> you know, really, they do. I mean, I, I spent a couple months with my daughter, and she's like, you know, Mom, you know, I gotta love you, Mom. I gotta love you. But is this what, just one more thing you're gonna do? You know, the course? You know, she's like, and I just have learned to just be ex an example, just to be exemplifying what I have learned and what this course has helped me to understand is that I really truly am not this body. I'm so much more. I, I'm still trying to figure that out or I'm still, I'm still asking for Holy Spirit to help me and let it be known to me what that really means and get out of my head and really incorporate that into my heart. I think with all the beautiful, beautiful people um, it's helped me to see that. And one of the biggest gifts that I have received is to learn how to develop my trust. And yes, I did put some people on a pedestal. Craig and I have had this conversation. You know, I, I have some special relationships with some people. Um, and then I had to learn that there is no one special. It's not about special. We are all special. And it's okay to be afraid, and it's okay to be emotional, and it's okay to say, I'm homeless! <laughs> <laughs> and, and be okay about it. Got a song for you later. Okay. By campfire. Campfire, absolutely. <laughs> so. Walk home with swag. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very timely. <laughs> <laughs> so really, what started to really happen for me is when I saw that everything outside of me was not going to give me what I truly wanted. I just asked Holy Spirit to show me. Let it be known to me. Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say and to whom? And that is my prayer every single day. Every day.
Sounds good to me. And, and, and then <laughs> what happens is we get inspired to do things like this. You know? Yeah. Trust me, this is not just me. I woke up with visions of this right here. Now, how this all happened, it was amazing. But I had a vision of this stage. It came to me. It came to me. I woke up one morning and was like, I have to order a backdrop. The flowers? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I was joking. Okay. I was joking when they asked me, where do you want to... There's a chair and a couch. And I said, a couch? <laughs> I always like Romano, you know, the thing. And somebody, who's here? Aaron here's today. Aaron's saying, you should just lay up there and put a pillow and just talk to the ceiling. Like that. <laughs> I said, that sounds very comfortable. <laughs> You're really <laughs> giving me some ideas. These, these are new ideas for the retreats, but it is comfortable, isn't it? You're pretty comfortable there. He's not, that's not a hot seat. He's, no, I, he's relaxed in there. Yeah, that was... That was more for sure. It was like, yeah, like the guest. Yes. Yeah. Ed McMahon and Johnny Carson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. I love you. And, uh, very good. Well, I think we're wrapping it up. But just what Cheryl shared is, it's not so much our earthly conditions, but it's our life of trust and trusting that everything that seems to happen to us, everything that seems to come to us, is for our good. And so, I think that's a beautiful, and, and that's a beautiful witness, because I, I know that is something that Jesus has guided me through as well, kind of moving about, not knowing where I would sleep from night to night, and uh, it was built to trust really fast, uh, not knowing where I would stay on a daily basis, and, and I'm grateful for it. I feel like that just prepared the way for everything that came in my life, so thank you for sharing that. And thank you all for coming. I'm so honored to be here with you all, and I feel like we're going to have a, a great healing extending and radiating to all the universe, our mind. So God bless you, and I hope to talk to you again here.